Okay, that's your subtle cue that we're about to begin. And welcome everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. This is our Draper Natural History Museum lunchtime expedition for April, and I'm thrilled that we have a full house here today. I'll be introducing the speaker. My name is Rebecca West, and I'm the curator of the Plains Indy Museum. And our speaker today, Dr. Ivy Marriott, she has a really fascinating and diverse life and career. She has a BA in philosophy, an MA in history of science, and her PhD is an American studies major and a native studies minor. And she's got these amazing life experiences, which include being a professional musician, a mother of four, a ski host, an immunology researcher, a high school science teacher, a solar physics researcher, an outreach astronomy educator, and a director of an astronomy-based online school. She is a very busy woman. <laughs> but her special interest is in ancient stone circles and their connection to cosmic cycles. Her first book is a copy of her dissertation and it describes the cultural and scientific history of the bighorn medicine wheel. And this examines the wheel's use as an indigenous instrument for learning about the sky and the world. Her second book is titled Star Circle, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. And I'd like to note that it will be available for sale upstairs after this presentation. So if you'd like to buy a copy and get a signed copy please join us afterwards right in front of the museum store. And Dr. Marriott is currently researching stone wheels around the world for their astronomical commonalities due to latitude, elevation, and sky conditions. And for those of you who have not yet been up to our site that we fondly call the Medicine Wheel up in the Bighorn Mountains, it's about 77 miles to the northeast and I know that you'll be oriented as to its location and beauty today. But I'm going to tell you right now that you'll have to wait until the snow melts. But after it does, I strongly encourage you to go visit. It's truly a special place. In the meantime, with discussion of her archaeoastronomical research, Dr. Marriott will share her knowledge of the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, which is an amazing site that is culturally and spiritually aligned with the earth and sky. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ivy Marriott. Is that already on? Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Um, quite an intro. My friends tell me I'm busy, but boy, when I listen to that list, I'm like, I guess I have been busy. Um, but my love is this medicine wheel, and obviously we all share that, um, even though I think we've never met. Has anybody in here met me before? Okay, so this is all about the wheel. This place isn't packed to have anything to do with me, but the wheel, we all share this. It's an awesome, and I have to tell you this, everywhere we do talks, the place is packed. When I was doing a talk right before I got my PhD, my committee tried to get into the Museum of the Rockies, and I think they hold 200 and something. And uh, my committee members got there in time, but they were in the line and didn't even get to come in and hear my talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that was pretty fun, just like, oh well. And I don't think that one was recorded, so they didn't have a YouTube choice later. Um, anyway, I'll try to get on with it. Is there any questions that are just burning that you came here hoping that, oh, finally, maybe I can get this answered? Does anybody have anyone they want to tell me about right now? And then I could make sure I hit that. Oh, great. Yes? Ooh, how old. I am going to touch that for the first time. You're the first audience to hear this based on the astronomical data. And what was that hand back there? Oh, the same question. Well, that's kind of the point of my talk, and I'm going to give four more talks uh, this year, and um, they'll all this will all be announced, and that, and so you're the first audience to get it, which makes sense because this is Wyoming. Oh, yeah. Sure. Ooh, I will show you. 
I have probably more slides on that than anything because, you know, people want to know. Anything else? So the age is a big deal. What about earlier, somewhere, somebody asked me who made it. Yes? Ooh, thanks for even asking that. I might have forgot to answer that one. And back there? Ooh. Yeah, I am aware, and I don't have any slides of them, although I do have pictures of them. Um, oh, good. If I forget to add it somewhere along the line because I didn't have a picture, um, just ask it at the end, or we can talk about it later, too, okay? Because that's, that's a neat, neat thing. This medicine wheel is not just one thing on one mountain. And yeah? Yeah. So how they're all connected, yeah. if how if and how. how. Yeah, he's asking if you can't hear him about how other sites in the Big Horns um, might both be connected to each other, like Fort Smith Medicine Wheel maybe. And in case I forget to bring it up, I'll throw this out to have you think about it. Turns out even the Anzac site, you guys heard of that up in Montana, uh, even has an alignment back to the wheel where that young boy was buried. So yeah. Oh, you mean to make the wheel? Have you been there? Oh, okay. Well, I better let you know that as I go through then. Thanks. I might have forgot to mention that. Ah, wrong way. This is bright one morning, as you can tell. I'm praying your guys' way. Um, I'm taking the picture. That's my husband way over there. And I left the truck in this on purpose just so you could get a perspective because kind of without it, you can't tell how big this wheel is. It's just magnificent. So for the, oh, how many people have been there? Okay, how many people haven't been there? Ooh, we've got a good audience both ways. So, something for everybody. Uh, my name's Ivy, if I forgot to say that, or if you forgot. So you can yell out Ivy if you need my attention. So this is the medicine wheel from above. Notice it is not flat. And to get there, wherever you might be in, that's not too bright, wherever you might be in Wyoming, uh, here's Grable, Lovell, you go up from Lovell and it's right about there. It's also on some Indian trails that kind of come from the park. I mean, that's one thing I'm really interested in is how, how you get there from lots of different places. And then here when you get close, there's this ray dome for uh, airplanes up here on top of Medicine Mountain. So when you hear that the wheel's on the top of Medicine Mountain, it is not on the top. It's actually on a shoulder. And I would love to have seen what was up there before they started building. <laughs> Here's the road to the wheel. You have about a mile and a half to walk. And then the wheel sits right up here. Now, that's September. If you go in the longest day of the year, wait till summer, the longest day, and all you'll need is some good shoes that can make it through snow and a nice winter coat. <laughs> Unless <laughs> you're young and flip-flops work just fine. <laughs> oh, um, I want to point out this little hill behind them because it's going to come in for that data on how I'm going to uh, date the wheel. You're going to see that little hill show up again, so I wanted you to know where it was from this angle. Um, yeah, these are just a couple kids that went up there last year. This was June 4th when they went up. So this is the first thing you see. And I want you to think about this. It's a very interesting time problem. What everything, I shouldn't say everything, because you kind of can see the rocks there. But the first thing you really see is all those, that beautiful fence made out of a nice rounded post. And then the uh, offerings along it tied to it. Um, but this isn't part of the historic wheel, or I should say history. Within our history, it is part of the wheel. But this isn't part of the wheel 50 years ago and before. This is a new cultural phenomena, mostly because people don't trust people going up there, so they've got to build a fence and tell you where to go. <laughs> so a lot of visitors. It's 80 degrees down here in Lovell. 
And the night before, when I was up here at the wheel, the stars were shining. I had shorts on. It was late September. It was fantastic. I couldn't believe it was late September. Next morning, I was going to spend the day. I could barely get out of the car. All this ice storm had come in. It was thundering and lightning. People leave really nice um, offerings on there. Look at that drum. I found that drum years later. It had blown, and it was kind of on the inside of the wheel, all weathered. So this wheel has moods to it, for sure. Take a really good coat. The only oral history we have of people who called this wheel their own and was part of their own culture is from a Greta. She was an elder sheep eater. And um, for my friend out here who told me she was 90, this woman you're looking at is 115 when this picture was taken. Nice, huh? And when I first saw this about, I don't know, 14 years ago, I thought, wow, she was old. And now 14 years later, I'm going, man, she looks good. <laughs> I mean, look how subtle, you know, she can bend. She can cross her legs. She doesn't need to even lean against anything. <laughs> like, she's doing great. <laughs> but uh, she lost her whole tribe, everybody, she said. Uh, they all died of smallpox. The teepees were full of her dead and dying relatives. I mean, we can't even imagine what that'd be like. She wandered by herself, I believe, in her 60s. Um, just fending for herself. And then she ran into a group of crow who lived near um, the mountains there, the Bighorn Mountains, and she joined them. So if she joined them at 60 or 65, she had another 40 or 50 years of being a grandmother within the crow tribe. And if she told her stories of the sheep eaters and how they used the wheel and shared with those grandchildren, she would have been teaching the grandchildren of grandchildren. She lived that much longer, right? So the crow um, will often connect to the wheel as their very own, their history, um, even though by their own tribal history, they've been here since about 1600. Some will go back farther, depending on the kind of crow. But, it, but for this, I think this is a lot of where they get their stories, is at the, at the knee of grandma telling them stories. But she was telling them sheep eater stories. And uh, this fellow named Alan, I'm having a hard time remembering his first name, but he wrote a book in about 19, I think, 11. And uh, this is his own picture of the wheel back then. And uh, he, although he puts it on Bald Mountain in one part of his story and puts it on Medicine Mountain on the other, so I don't know. Maybe there was also one on Bald Mountain, and he got messed up. I went to Bald Mountain, and there were a bunch of rocks up there, but they just spelled out somebody's name. <laughs> so naughty, naughty. <laughs> Um, and so for the fellow that asked me about what the rocks are made of, they're kind of a limestone. This used to be under the water, believe it or not, probably way back when the dinosaurs were around. Um, and so they're this beautiful white limestone. But at one time, a fellow named Ransom, who I'm not going to talk about much during this talk, but you can ask me later if you want to know, he said the whole rim of this was not just limestone. It had this beautiful kind of glisteny blue stone that was brought in, I think, from the Priors. Um, yeah, I think it was from the Priors. But anyway, I'm, I'm still trying to search down that stone. He said a lot of it ended up in the gardens in Lovell, his own garden included. <laughs> so anyway, somebody I'll find that. But because later, and I probably won't tell you this later either, that rim could represent the Milky Way, then it kind of makes sense that it would be all these glitterly, gr glittery blue stones. So Agretta, that sheep eater, told a story to Alan about being married up at the wheel, that she actually had a big adventure there first where her husband-to-be and she kind of fended off a bear and they killed the bear and it was charging him and stuff. And then later had their wedding up there and they brought all the 28 tribes of the sheep eaters together. How did the sheep eaters know how to get there from everywhere they were? Well, she said springtime. And I just put this because if anybody knows flowers, this is like one of the very first flowers to pop up. If you don't get out there right after the snow's left, you won't see it. Um, and at Agretta's time, I went too far, springtime. If she said we were married at springtime, she would have meant like solstice. You saw us in our coats at solstice. <laughs> um, and so... I'm thinking they would know how to get there on the solstice because you could tell which day was the solstice no matter where you live as long as you can see the sun and track it. So what she said about her people, our women were as beautiful as the sun. 
She talked about how noble her people were and how good they were, a story about the Sioux coming and wanting. Uh, the sheep eaters had beautiful bows made out of the horn of sheep. And uh, they also really tanned their uh, hides really well. And so people wanted their stuff. And the Sioux came up and were going to just come and get it. And the Sioux, of course, you guys probably already know this, can be a combination of, of quite a few tribes. A lot of tribes that, a lot of people who didn't have a tribe actually would join in with what we call the Sioux. So you've got to be careful when you read history about the Sioux. You don't know for sure what the, that group was. Um, especially if you're reading the story by someone who didn't know what tribes they were anyway. <laughs> so anyway, but this is how Alan tells the story coming from Agretta herself, is that uh, the Sioux tried to come up one of these canyons. Did I give you a picture of the canyon? Oh, maybe I did in the last one. And uh, the chief says, no, we don't want to fight. We're peaceful people. But they could defend themselves. When the Sioux came up, they r the sheep eaters rolled a bunch of rocks on them and said they killed every human, horse, and dog. Nothing left. I would love to go in one of those canyons and see if you can find the remains of that. I mean, that's only, what, a couple hundred years ago. There should still be remains. This was, uh, I don't really remember. I think that was a September. It's just beautiful. That's why I put it in there. So up where Greta and her people lived, it's not your usual craggy mountain tops. It's this beautiful, thick grass, wonderful water, and lots of wildlife. I've seen more moose up there than I've seen anywhere. Just incredible. Um, and so when Buffalo Bill asked one of his uh, favorite friends to stay and be part of the group, the friend said, I can't do it in the summer because I've got to be in the bighorns. And Buffalo Bill's like, what's such a big deal about the, you know, the bighorns? We got Yellowstone. We got a little tour all over. And he goes, nope, sorry. And then years later, um, Buffalo Bill finally made it to the bighorns. He goes, oh, my gosh. I don't know if I would have toured Europe. I think I would have just hung out here. So <laughs> in, the, in dry Wyoming especially, oh, and this is late in the fall, but it's, it's just gorgeous up here. This is actually late October and shows that even when the snow is on it, uh, you can still see these alignments in the rocks quite well. How many people are familiar with the little people stories? Wow. Well, if you've been to the wheel, and a whole bunch of you have, um, you've probably already interacted with the little people at some level. Um, and we can talk about this later. Um, but this is one of the caves there. and. Uh, I don't even know if I should say more than that. I'd say pay, pay attention when the little people come up and, and listen to the stories. If you heard them described and nobody told you what you were listening to, a lot of people of European descent would assume you were talking about leprechauns. The uh, description is very similar. Um, the little people, though, tend to come during vision quests and uh, help people understand things. And as one Indian elder told me, who actually used to work here, uh, George Horse Capture Jr. Um, years ago. He's now an elder himself now. But he told me little people aren't really people. They're little beings. He said um, they don't like people, humans. They think we're stinky. But <laughs> they feel like we have no direction. They feel sorry for us. So they come at certain times and help us with our direction. So that's probably a good intro to little people. <laughs> Now, Cut Ear was a crow, and he would give guided tours up there. It's a good thing he did it back then, because I don't think you can do that now. <laughs> At least not commercial ones. You can't take money for it. But he would take people up there over many years. I think this picture of him down below is he's about 65 or something, so he's doing great. But notice the wheel itself up there, how similar it is. You know, one of the things I do is look at all the lines and the rocks, the spokes, because people told me one of my first trips up to the wheel, a waitress at Lovell says, Oh, you can't tell anything by that thing. The Boy Scouts go up there, and they just clean it up and change it and move it. Nothing's the same. And I'm like, huh. She didn't know I'd just been studying it for my master's and looking through all these pictures. But I thought, but locally, that's what they're telling people when they come in. So I went to town. I went to the senior citizen and said, senior citizen center and asked anybody if they knew anybody who was part of those Boy Scouts. Oh, they all knew the story, but no one could point me in a small town like Lovell. Nobody could point me to one person who really knew one person who actually did it. But they do remember they did do it. So if any of you guys know anybody, I need verification of this story. Right now it's an urban legend. But if I, I think the scouts really did do it. We just can't find any of them. 
But if they did do it, they kept it really well with kind of the lumps in the ground of where the spokes were, because I'm not finding a difference in those spokes over time. Did anybody know William Talbull? I didn't know him either, but I always want to put this in the show because he worked so hard for that wheel to be preserved. And it had been dug into. People had messed it up. You know, archaeologically, they couldn't find much in there because, you know, treasure hunters had already gone in. But um, I think he's a lot to uh, honor the fact that it's still there and we can visit it. 1958, uh, the Wyoming Archaeology Society went in and did a dig. And, and they, oh, thank goodness, they didn't dig up everything. They dug up certain areas and they made really good maps of that. So that helps me when I do the astronomy to know which one of those spokes are still accurate and which ones they probably put back as well as they could, but uh, that maybe I shouldn't trust as much as the others. And some of these people are still alive too, although I haven't met them yet. Now one archaeologist went up there, uh, Wilson, Michael Wilson, he came to a talk and he said that wheel has nothing to do with the stars, nothing to do with the sky. He was, for some reason, really didn't want anybody to think about that. And I asked him, well, you were there quite a while. I think he spent about a, a month up there at least, uh, maybe two, in doing a grad study up there. And uh, I said, well, did, did, it ever, did it ever feel like it was talking to the sky or did, did you see any pattern connections, you know? And he said, no, it was misty every day when I went up there. And I never went up there at night. <laughs> so that's kind of what, as an astronomer, I have to deal with is when I try to get to the bottom of a story, where's the data, you know? So John Eddy went up there in 1974, and this is the story you hear the most. It's the one they'll tell you up at the wheel about the star alignments. And uh, that's very easy to find, so I'm not going to talk much about it to tell you the truth. Uh, Eddy did... Uh, indigenous people already knew it pointed, that this one cairn pointed to the, let me get, see if this will work, can't really see it. Um, the one cairn off to this side, the E1 points up to that summer solstice. That was common knowledge, pretty much. It was already being published in magazines, and indigenous people who had been to the wheel felt the same way. But Eddie went up there with Western science, you know, instruments, and in his mind verified it, although, as you'll find out in my talk a little bit later, he said it was if within one and a half degrees of accurate. And that one and a half degrees is going to make a huge difference. So here's just kind of his. I tried to add some color to it to make it funner to look at. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but you've got a few different alignments. Notice that in Cairn F, that's where someone would sit to see a lot of these different alignments if they were aligned with the cairns. Um, in my study, I found that those spokes were actually more aligned with the stars. The cairns may have changed a bit over time. And Jack Robinson went in later and worked on the same kind of thing. I'm not, he created this down at the University of Florida, but I don't have time to tell you about it. But he went to Fort Smith, which is where the Crow Scarface had fasted up at the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, and the little people had come to him and somehow helped him understand how the wheel worked. And he went down uh, lower elevation and built that, oops, sorry, that second wheel there. That's the Fort Smith wheel. Has anybody been to that one? So the thing is, that they don't really look that much alike, do they? If you're looking at the ground. Here's my joke about archaeologists and archaeoastronomers. Archaeologists look down, and they might not see the similarity between these two. Archaeoastronomers look up, and they see the similarity because these align to the same stars. Because you have to take in the fact that you're at a different elevation and that your skyline might be high or low. And when your skyline gets higher, it takes the stars longer to come up, which moves where they're going to be pointed to. So you've got to look at the sky, and you've got to get out of the mist if you're going <laughs> to check something out for astronomy. <laughs> so that's just kind of the difference between Eddy and uh, Robinson. Robinson thought the stars were higher when they were um, aligned. Ed Eddy thought they were lower, so you'll see a little difference in the literature doesn't really matter because we don't know that culture. And neither of those two men spent enough time at the wheel themselves to know when it would actually be the most useful to see a star. The physics of the stars tell us that, or the physics of the atmosphere tell us that we shouldn't be able to see the stars till they're higher. But I went up there and in just one night and morning um, totally undid that physics because I verified that you can see those stars right till they hit the horizon. 
and that's not supposed to happen. So if you do this based on physics and math back home and don't go to the wheel, you're not going to get the right answers. <laughs> so we set up and did some uh, nighttime shots. Oh, here's my question. Was this used for astronomy? I'm sure it was used for a lot of things, definitely vision quests. Some people said that they danced uh, in there. I think uh, Greta, well, she didn't say they danced. She said the, tw the 28 tribes just lined up on each of the spokes um, for her wedding. But at any rate, um, but could it be used for astronomy? That was my biggest question. Yes, yes, that's been brought up in the moon, the moon cycle. And uh, I'll talk more of the 28 later, I think I will, if I get that far. Yeah, 28 is really a rhythm to life, isn't it? And that's why um, Ransom, uh, who I talked about earlier that talked about the you know galaxy around the outside, he did all this stuff about symbolism of the Utah Aztecans and the ancient Shoshone, which the sheep eater would have been part of that. Um, and he felt just from the symbolism, he knew nothing about the sky. He even said, I'm not talking about the real sky. I'm just talking about symbolism. But his symbolism was actually accurate with the real sky once I went up there and measured stuff. So that, that 28 flow of life and the sky, cultures all over the world have divided the sky into 28 sections so that they can track everything, the sun, the planets, the moon. It's a really a magic number. So what about this? This is a little closer to our time. The wheels, you know, quite a ways before our time, before most of the indigenous people here. They don't have stories of its creation or anything. It's kind of beyond us all. But this actually happened during a lot of our lifetime. And um, so just to show of hands, think about it for a minute. Could this have been used for astronomical use? It's now a ruin. How many people think it could have in some way? I won't even hold you to what way. Okay, how many people uh, don't really think it looks very astronomical? You'd need some more info or data or something. Yeah, and how many people just aren't sure? It just looks like an old wreckage. Okay, so this will give you your hint. Anybody see this movie? <laughs> Armageddon, <laughs> Bruce Willis. <laughs> they had to send him up there to get rid of that asteroid. Okay, so this is actually where he's standing. This wasn't just used for astronomy. This was used in a culture that went to another world 50 years ago, and none of us in this room, maybe four, even recognized it as having anything to do with space. And look how much it had to do. People left there and walked on another planet. So do you think amongst us we can really gauge whether that wheel that might be thousands of years old how it was used for astronomy when we can't gauge this. And believe me, you are not alone. No audience gets this until they see that. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, so in 1905, it kind of happened to us. We went from actually looking at the sky to looking through our telescopes. Then we had our cameras look through our telescopes. And this is an excellent time for a really fun story of uh, when I was an astronomy teacher, I went to Kitt Peak. It has a zillion telescopes up there. People from all over the world go there and do uh, their data collections. So they're going to bring us high school science teachers in and let us really learn something, you know, from these high-powered astronomers. <laughs> so we take this telescope, which has a mirror that's, uh, oh, nine feet across. And it was so big that you could actually ride on the telescope as it went round and round, way up high. It was really cool. Outside on this kind of catwalk. So anyway, we set it up. We get the computer all ready. We aim it at our target. And we're going to take like a 20-minute picture so we're taking pictures of black holes and the jets that come out of them, and we're just all excited. So we go outside, beautiful nights, like 90 degrees outside Tucson there, <laughs> and somebody asked where the object was that we just, you know, put the telescope on. They asked the guy who, oh, let's see, he was probably about 50. He'd been doing research on this object his entire career, and they asked him where that object in the sky was. And here's what he did. He looks around this way. Then he looks around that way. <laughs> and then he says, I don't think it's up yet. <laughs> and the elementary teachers, the couple high school teachers, we're just looking at each other going, we don't want to embarrass him to death. We're not saying anything. But the elementary teacher luckily goes, um, doesn't it have to be up for us to point the telescope to it? <laughs> And I'll say, I'm glad I don't remember his name, because I'd hate to embarrass him. 
But he was such a good guy, he actually just dropped his head and started laughing, and he goes, yes, of course. I know, let's look at where the telescope's pointing. <laughs> so that's how dependent we are. We've lost our sky watchers. So don't in a minute think that an astronomer is a sky watcher. And uh, I just throw this up because it's my joke. This is Tide Books. My brother's a fisherman in Alaska. And I looked at the moon on this, and I'm like, that moon is wrong. And they're telling you all about tides. They're helping you understand tides. And I'm like, but they're showing you the wrong picture. So anyway, I got hold of that company, and they said, oh, oh, sorry, that was just a typo that one year. <laughs> but then we looked back through tide books. They've been publishing these tide books with the wrong moon. Um, oops. Oops, wrong way twice. Um, can you see that? See how it starts with, uh, well, maybe this one's better. The new moon, first quarter, full moon, last quarter. First quarter, that moon faces the sun. The lit part is the sun. And the first quarter is going to be when it's moving away from the sun at evening. So the quarter is going to be that way with the light going that way. And they have it totally the opposite. So what I was happy is they actually did admit it was wrong. And those other two things are wrong, too, but I won't bother you with those right now. <laughs> but pretty much, you can make a documentary. Say if it was a documentary on the 50s, and you got this great 1950s car and a 1950s house. This is how bad this is when I see this stuff. It's like you took that, all that stuff that was accurate, but you took the car and set it upside down on top of the garage. But nobody's supposed to notice, because nobody really knows where cars are supposed to go. That's how bad this stuff is when I see it. I'm like, you can't put the moon there. <laughs> So here I'm just showing you how um, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel up here, which they now call just Medicine Wheel, I guess. I still call it Bighorn Medicine Wheel. Look how much that watching cairn where you could sit and get out of the wind, because you're right at the top of the world here, um, looks a whole lot like a Zuni sun station that has been used in a time period when we knew they used those to watch the sun and keep track of it. And also, uh, one of the people on my committee, uh, told me, like, it's just a circle. How can it be used at the stars? It could point to anything. Yeah, you know those compasses we use? They're a circle. We use those for navigation. And what about those compass roses we print on maps all the time? Those are circles, yet we use those for directions. <laughs> and so I was so happy when I found, there's movies about this, too, this Polynesian navigator teaching his uh, grandson how to use a circle of coral to know where the stars rise and fall, to get across a dark ocean with no land in sight and find a little island that's only a mile wide and get to the right place. And you don't do this just by that circle. Every one of those pieces of coral have a story that goes with the stars. And he would say, when you get out on that water and you get afraid that you don't know where you are and like, oh my gosh, what am I thinking? Trust your ancestors' stories they will get you home. This is uh, just showing how much even when the sun goes low, how you can see the sun's shadow. So you can track where that sun is, what time of year it is, what time of day it is. And Greta had said that that uh, center cairn is where, well, the translation of what she said was the sun chief sits. But that word chief has kind of got problems because that's been changed in a Euro kind of thinking. But um, as far as someone who looks after something, the one who looks after the sun would have sat there. So she gave us that in her oral history. Now, there's lots of medicine wheels, and the bighorn medicine wheel is unlike most of them. Medicine wheels is a term that's been given to a lot of different circles of stone. And that medicine part, and I, and I asked the same elder, uh, George ha Horse Capture Jr., about why medicine, and is there a more accurate way to say this? Because you'll see this written where people say, oh, that was just made up by white people. And, and he says, no, that's the best translation he can think of is, is their own uh, language for that and, and any other languages he knows of that are native. And the medicine is just something that has a power to affect you, good or for bad. Although another uh, elder at Fort Peck told me that I shouldn't ever say bad, that it's the, the bighorn medicine wheel is good medicine. He said, I shouldn't even bring up the other, so I apologize. <laughs> I will be better. So you can see there's a lot of different kinds. The uh, bighorn medicine wheel is one of about five that's, uh, can't see it. It's this one that says Majorville over here. 
kind of halfway down on this side. It looks little there, but it's actually one of the biggest ones there. The other ones could be um, places where they buried someone. Other ones do have astronomical connections. They do face towards things. But these big ones are complex. They're so complex. I've been studying the astronomy of it for, uh, I don't know, 10 years or more. And I still keep finding more nuances that it takes care of. It's not this kind of wheel. It's not your four-directional wheel. It's not a Plains Indian wheel. I'm not saying Plains Indians can't adopt it and make it their own. I, I would never go against the, the land adopting people or people adopting the wheel, but that's not the kind of, this isn't a, it, it only has one, uh, out of the four directions, it only has one line that at goes north. And then as far as talking about culture, this is kind of fun, because you see that nice big walkway around there and you're told to walk left? That is totally a new culture thing. When you look at the old pictures, oh, plus notice there's no four, four, four quarters to that. This is a 28 section wheel. <laughs> um, there's, no, there's no walkway around that. And you see Cutter, when he took people up there, I've seen more pictures of him too, he, he didn't have them walk around the wheel. They, they went in and they gave offerings at places. It does look like there's a ledge there though or something. These are just some old pictures. So this walking around and making that path is totally our current thing. And notice that, uh, I think it was in the 20s, they built this rock wall. And this it just kills me as an archaeoastronomer because it looks like they used a bunch of other cairns, which they probably thought were just fasting beds, which they still shouldn't have moved. But at any rate, they're trying to protect the wheel, but I think they got rid of a whole bunch of outer cairns that in 1922, Grinnell said they were there. Luckily, he gave directions and how far away they are, and I've been able to find a couple remnants of them. That's just a uh, beautiful evening. No, morning. That's solstice. Okay, so I think this is where we get into our how old is it. Notice I sent, well, you didn't know this, but notice how it's not quite, that, that light is not quite lined up with that spoke, like in Eddie's diagram. Oh, sorry, did you want to say something? Um, if you're an indigenous person, you are. Um, if you're anybody else, you have to ask them. Kind of get permission of why. Um, I don't think anybody thinks that there's much harm you can do because a lot of those rocks are pretty embedded. It's more just like a respect thing. So if you really wanted to go in, you just have to talk to the Forest Service. Um, and then maybe some indigenous, the Medicine Wheel Alliance, you might have to get there okay. So you notice how that light doesn't actually line up with that spoke there. And that's the one that's supposed to line up with it. And Eddie said, well, it is like a degree and a half off. That's not bad. Well, when I went up there, you can't see it with your eyes. But the very first time I went there, um, this spoke does line up with a little rock. It looks, like, it looks like a little rock from here over on this hill. And so I thought, what the heck is that? That's awfully interesting, you know? Eddie never brought it up. I don't know why. Maybe because the light blinds you and he didn't see it. I'm not sure. But uh, it took me three years before I went and found that rock, and then it became a huge deal just two years ago. That's how I dated this. Um, so I had a student who went and took a picture of it the year before this and said, Ivy, I'm so sorry. No matter where I stood, I could not get that sun to line up with that uh, spoke. And he was all depressed because he mounted this big expedition of three of his friends and carry the camera and everything up there early in the morning. I said, oh, this is the best news I can hear because now we can date the wheel. So he actually went back with me to help me date it. There he is right there. So we found this rock, but it's not just a rock. I got up there and as I walked around it, it's got two holes. One he's looking through that goes this way back to the wheel. And then it's got a second hole that goes towards the east, like where the sun would rise on the equinox. So these aren't just crisscross. They have to go at a little bit of an angle to get both of those. So if they were made by the wind, that is one really cool wind. <laughs> and I'm just looking back, but this is mostly to show you that see how the land drops away? That as soon as the sun makes it over that ridge, it's shooting through that hole. And there's my husband back when he had long hair. He's taken a picture of it. He decided long hair wasn't any fun when he was working on things, hanging down into mechanical stuff. <laughs> and then our friend uh, 
who's native, who has really long, long braids, says, oh, you're just supposed to tie them together and throw both the braids over your head. <laughs> he goes, darn it, three years of growing my hair, just wasted because I cut it. <laughs> but anyway, right here uh, sits the medicine wheel. So you can imagine how I felt when I got up there, not only found the rock, but when I looked back, it was looking at the wheel. Like, okay, so bring up, this was years ago, and then in 2017, we got back up there with some instruments. There's that hill that I showed that, that little, those little girls were playing on. Hmm, some lighting just, just doesn't work. So that grassy part you see is right underneath the wheel. The wheel's pretty much in the center of the frame above that. I have to get a better picture. So here it is on Google Earth. If you go from that same line up, almost shows up okay right there and then you follow that solstice alignment I don't know why I have two different pictures here it um that's that rock and then the red line is that east-west equinox line which would you know have the sun there but I haven't been there in equinox to verify that for you so it's about four three four point three miles and notice how I have the degrees there 53.53 degrees that's what came off Google Earth now I have to go there and measure it myself, which I did with a theodolite. And then we you know, used all these measurements to try to figure this out. Now you have multiple problems uh, in that you have to know the software you use to do this, and you have to know what its limits and its parameters are. And so I'm not going to exaggerate. I'm gonna give you a very conservative number. <laughs> it could be older, but this came out to be 3200 BC. It could be five, eight hundred years old or easy. I'm just trying to keep it onto where I can, I can tell by this if all of these pieces I've given you, if the hole is where the sun came through, if this lineup was solstice, which it sure hangs with it, then that's how much the sun has moved in 5,000 years. The sun moves really slow, so you can't do it like Eddie did where, uh, I mean, uh, the way they did the stars where Eddie did a uh, cairn to the other side or just to a star, it's not good enough. You need something for the sun that goes way across like that, like four miles away. You need another point that you can measure to get that long, long, we call it long baseline so that you can even catch a movement like this because he just said, oh, it's just an error of a degree and a half. No, that degree and a half is 5,000 years. That's not an error. And I'm thinking now that they built the wheel there because they had that rock that they could make an alignment that for thousands of years, people would be able to still keep watching the sky and what the sky does. Uh, I'm try my brain's being overloaded, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out what to say and what not to say to you. <laughs> I'll calm down. <laughs> Yes, northeast, northeast where the sun would come out in the summer solstice. The other rock went east-ish, but remember, it can't just go east. You can't just look at the rock. You've got to look up, and where the sun comes up, if the horizon isn't down at level, then you don't want it straight east on equinox. It's going to have had time to travel a bit, so you've got to keep that in mind. So let's just uh, clear your brain for a minute. <laughs> Mine's overloaded, I don't know about yours. So this is the degree change between, here's your dates up here, 3200 BC. Back then the solstice was in July. This was just 2017 when I took the measurement. Solstice was 20 to 21st. So we've got pretty much one degree of change. When I actually, this is the program, the star program. When I measured the change right there at the wheel, it was closer to one and uh, two thirds. So even by careful conservative, uh, even if I only used one degree, we're still back to 3200 BC. Now this isn't odd for this wheel at all. Um, oh, this is the other thing too. Also the North Star changes, did you guys know that? Here's the Big Dipper. And so you know it usually points, points at Polaris. There's the Little Dipper. Uh, that would be our North Star right now, or close to it, but here I marked the North Central Pole for you. It's actually in the tail of the dragon, Thuban. So that also is 5,000 years ago. Just to let you know that things shift up there, but they shift slowly over time, so it gives us a chance to follow them. So the Bighorn Medicine Wheel has that sister wheel, Majorville Wheel in Canada. 
That one also has 28 spokes. It also has a really good horizon. You can track the sky. The difference in this was it hadn't been disturbed, uh, at least much. The central cairn hadn't been disturbed at all. And they could cut that in half and slow, I mean, they didn't cut it in half first, but they excavated it in ha the half of it, down, 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 keeping one side intact for future use. And all the artifacts came out perfectly matching other places where you know we'd carbon dated and we kind of knew which artifacts came at what time. That all worked well. They got down to the carbon and the ochre of you know the original fire to start it. And they could carbon date it and artifact date it. And that one's 3200 BC. So it's not any great leap to think the bighorn medicine wheel is. We just didn't have the artifacts to do it before. I think that's just a pretty picture. I can't remember why I put that in there. We'll find out in a minute. <laughs> Maybe I just wanted to contrast them and just say, look at that great skyline. Now, interesting thing about the snow is you can get up there and use this when there's snow. One of the snowmobilers up there told me that, oh good, told me that she couldn't get to it in the winter because it was blown off and she'd have to walk a mile or so from her snowmobile. So if someone wanted to go and use that in the winter to catch any kind of star event or sun event, they could. Now, you see the, s the, see the moon in there? So you can, you can even tell time with the moon and where the moon falls in these segments, which, because I've already written a book, when I gave these talks and hadn't written the book, I felt I had to tell you everything as fast as I could. But actually, it is in my book. And you can either buy it here or you might be able to open it up and look at whatever pages you want on Amazon, too, if you're ever interested. <laughs> but if you want the whole book to write in, you can get it here. Um, so just where the moon is, follow the moon down. And you can take those like segments, those pieces of pie, as segments of the sky. And you can track. You can use it to track. I'll take you into the night. I've spent all night there many times. It's very, very fun. Do you see... Big Dipper should be in there. Oh, yeah. Does anybody see it? It's kind of laying down. There it is. There's the... And then go straight up. And this is close to the pole, s pole right now, the pole star. And so for me, I kept getting all these weird uh, orientations from old maps. Nobody would have the same north. It was driving me crazy. And even when I went up there and measured, there's something magnetic up there that makes your measuring devices go crazy. <laughs> in fact, it blew up our telescope one night. But anyway, <laughs> that's another story. But notice this dip in the mountains. It turns out that this dip, this wheel is sat so that this dip, the middle of it, is right in the north. And I needed to get this picture to show this because all these stars that go round and round, and I probably have a picture of that. Isn't this beautiful what we caught? This is our first time trying Pleiades, shooting star. This is actually Jupiter coming up. And the planets will come up sort of near where the sun is, depending on what season and what time of year. And so anyway, we predicted where it would come up, and then we got to go up there and see where it would come up. So that was fun. And of course, the Milky Way, just unbelievable, fantastic. That red light is just my husband holding the laser on that solstice line. And there's Lovell that looks like a big city because of how long we had to expose it to get the stars. But you can see how you're, and this was smoke season. So <laughs> it's even better when it's not smoke season. Um, this is the Milky Way laying on the side. This is part of the program, not a real photo. And the difference is, is just I want you to see how the Milky Way sometimes lays down and sometimes stands up. So just tracking where the Milky Way is gives us a lot of information about is our orbit still where it was? Has anything changed? When we have a crazy winter like we did this year, we could go to our sky watchers and say, are we still in the same orbit around the sun? Did something happen? And a sky watcher, not an astronomer, <laughs> could tell you. <laughs> Those poor uh, astronomers. Must just be, okay, here's a story about the bear that heads to the north to gather water in the winter. See the, the dipper is filling with water. Those northern, northern uh, rains and snow. And now it's springtime and it's starting to dump the water out. And as it gets towards summer, it's used up all of its water. And we wait and wait through the autumn, dry autumns in this part of the world sometimes. And then, ah, it's heading back to the north again. Is it going to go again? 
So this is just an example of a story that sounds like a fun story of a bear going to the north. But if you see that bear in a place where it should be dumping water and there's no water, that old story tells you that for thousands of years we have had water at this season based on the stars. This isn't based on somebody's numbers or somebody on the TV. It's based on the stars and the stories that come down through time. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of science in those stories. But I love how that bear trucks across the north. Do, 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 do. So if you watch the stars uh, with a camera, it's hard. I've tried it with my eyes. I can't get them to do it yet, but I haven't given up. You can, sta you can start seeing the stars move. And pretty soon, if you watch them long enough, they'll make these nice long arcs. So through an entire night, it'll go. the stars will do a full turn. And uh, through a full year, they do too, although that might confuse you. But so because of where they turn, they're going to line up with different things at different times. But a, a sky watcher could track all that. This is Casa Rinconada. I threw this on here because I asked to go there and take pictures of the stars years ago. And they told me, no archaeology in the park. We're not doing that. And I'm like, no, no, it's astronomy. I'm taking pictures. No archaeology. <laughs> so I got to take that archaeo word out of my astronomy. <laughs> anyway, they let somebody do it. So I was really glad. Uh, oh, by the way, R Casa Rinconada also has 28 niches in the wall, unevenly spaced. Now, if you were just making a symbol, you could have made that wheel up on that mountain so all those spokes were even, and you could have made this even. But the sky's not even. The stars are not even. And so if you're trying to track stars, I'm not going to go through that. So here's patterns. We all know this, right? Would you recognize those three letters if I put them somewhere else? And there's, you know, 26 letters we all have to learn by the time we're about five or six. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Can anybody still recognize the letters? Okay, would you believe it if the stars move? Sky watchers can still tell where they are and where they should have been and all that. And think of it, in 26 letters, there's 26 bright stars. That's why I'm making this analogy. 26 letters, we can end up telling things about the deep past, the future, poetry, Im imaginative stuff, science fiction, all with 26 letters. Our brains can handle that. So whenever that astronomy looks hard and confusing, just remember you didn't get to learn it in preschool. If you did, it'd be no problem. You'd walk up to the middle school and go, oh yeah, cool, whoa, I know what's going on here. You'd see the pattern. We're just not trained to. I think, is this a movie too? Oh, I love this. This is the, <laughs> this is the sky program if you forget to turn off the satellites. And so <laughs> these are man-made satellites, even though this is an ancient thing that they just are throwing in here. <laughs> but actually, it's cool when you have, you know, meteorites, it looks that neat. So we're a space-faring race. Okay, there's that one again. Uh, do I have one minute left? Okay, one minute. <laughs> we're close to it. I just want to throw this up because this is a story I think you all know or could know. It's from the Bible. It's the one about Eve and the serpent in the garden. You've got this serpent guarding these apples. If you go into Greek mythology, they call it mythology if it's over there. But uh, same story, it's the uh, snake, uh, or it's a dragon guarding the garden of night. And the, the stars of the night is what it is over there. And so next to the dragon there you've got, or the serpent, you've got Hercules. Look where Hercules' heel is. In the Bible it says, that the heel of man, of woman's children, will be bitten forever by the snake. They'll always be at odds. The, the human child will always be trying to crush the snake's head, and the snake will always be trying to bite the human. So it was only took me like 50 years to find out that was the story of the sky. <laughs> and what's happening here is this red, this red circle is the North Pole. I showed you how that changed. The North Pole uh, changes over that whole circle in about 24,000 years. So over and over again, time repeats. And that snake is always trying to bite that heel. Now that story is a lot easier to remember than if I left you just saying, well, you know, Draco is right there at so many degrees from Hercules. And all if I talk just Western science, none of us would remember it. But a good story like that, there was this bad lady that ate an apple and this <laughs> and the snake. So our stories are powerful. They're actually a better way. And I bring you back to Greta because she was the storyteller of the wheel. 
Um, they're very powerful and they're full of science. They're full of astronomy, the part of science that I'm studying right now. Um, so I think I'm going to end it there. I do have some more slides, so if the slides connect to anything someone asks, I'll show them to you. Um, there's my book. This is what is at the center of the wheel if the wheel mirrors the sky. And my whole book is about the wheel mirroring the sky and how I found that out. That's what's at the center of it, although you need a telescope to see that. So let me stop there and take questions. Did, oh, thank you, sorry. Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> oh I love you. He said, is there any connection between petroglyphs and the medicine wheel, uh, petroglyphs and the Bighorn Basin? That's exactly the thing I'm studying right now because Greta said, if you want to know about our people, go look at the rock art. It's all written on the walls. So of course I went down to medicine lodge and sat myself in front and said, I'm not moving until something talks to me. <laughs> and uh, so that's the next story. If you give me your uh, email, I'll actually send you the paper I just wrote on that, that um, is just being sent to the journal right now. But yes, there is. There's something really cool happening at Medicine Lodge Creek, and it seems like they're very connected. At the wheel, you have a horizon astronomy where you're looking at the horizon. At the petroglyphs, they tend to be sometimes on north-south cliffs, which gives you a solar noon shadow effect on them. And so you can do what we call a meridian with that. Yes, sir? Oh, that's awesomely sweet of you. Thank you for your great question. <laughs> Any others? Yeah. Ooh, thank you. It's so cool because when I forget to say stuff, you guys just help me bring it out later. Yeah, the climate, these people weren't living on the plains at 3200 BC, or I should say it's the edge of it. They were probably starting to move down there. Um, I should also say that this date for the wheel could be the origin of it because it was that solstice alignment. But those other dates Eddie uh, gave and Robinson gave would have been last alignment dates. We can't tell that anybody has aligned the wheel since about 1100. Um, but back to your question, yeah, they, it seems to me, I'm not an anthropologist or archaeologist, but what I've read from what they've done is it was just too hot down low. And so people lived up there, uh, some of them all year, tons of artifacts going back to you know 8000 BC up there. But the weather was just nicer, cooler, more water, all that stuff. It's called the Altai Thermal. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> I know somebody said that in one talk. Well, why would they even want to go up there? And it was like 95 degrees that day. And I'm like, does anybody have to answer that, actually? <laughs> this person must live in air conditioning. <laughs> Any others? Oh, yeah, there is an arrow right up on top. Have you seen that one not far from the wheel? If you kind of go northeast, northwest. Oh, yeah, it's right up there. Just walk over there. Um, very cool, and I have, I have some good pictures of that. That one, I have not checked it to go farther, and I'm wondering, because it kind of heads up towards Montana. Um, and then the Matitsi, the Matitsi one, I think, is well known to, to point at the wheel. It's been years since I looked at it, but it seemed like it did. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, one thing we could still do is, uh, and it's just come out in the last few years, is we could go and get dirt from under rocks that we're pretty sure haven't moved and then analyze that for the last time starlight hit it. Now, if we took that data and put it to the astronomical data, because we just don't have archaeological data for the medis this medicine wheel. So if we put the astronomy with that kind of data of when the sunlight hit it, then we, get, we might even get an idea whether the spokes were built first or last, you know, in the center cairn and all those kind of things. But we'd have to be careful um, and not do it to too many of them, because as we go in time, we always get better techniques, and we don't want to mess up too much for the future. But I think there's a whole wide ranging, and um, the native folks uh, over and over again have told me that, yeah, these places are all connected to the next sacred place and the next sacred place. It's just a network all over the earth. But I myself haven't gone out and in any way verified that. I'm more an astronomer than that, although I think it's super cool. So, 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't know what group, but since Agreta, you know, talked of it as her wheel, they definitely, you know, counted it as theirs. But the Majorville wheel, an interesting thing is, although it dated to 3200 B.C., had all these nice artifacts, when it got to about 1000 B.C., the artifacts stopped. And it looked like it went 1,200 years. Nobody used it till 200 A.D. I wonder. I hadn't thought of that. So at about 200 A.D., a group came in, but at that time they had a lot of the similar artifacts, I guess, to the ones before them. Um, but one thing different, they had something called a, you guys probably know how to say it better than I do, it's like a buffalo stone, a miskium. How do you say that? Miskin. So close. <laughs> okay, that's not right. Don't quote that. Um, so yeah, then they started adding that to that Majorville one. But I find that very interesting that it's a whole different group. Now down here, Agreta's people, linguistic-wise, and I'm not a linguistic either, but the linguistic people say that her language was the language of the Uto, Aztec, and ancient Shoshone. So the language and symbolism seem to stay the same right down to her, or similar. That's as close as we know, and I have looked everywhere and studied. Ooh, no, wouldn't that be awesome? She asked about DNA work. Okay, anything else? One more question, sir? Ooh, yeah. Have you heard of the Nazca lines in Peru? Those are those monkeys and all the fun stuff. Well, uh, a friend who I met in Peru at an archaeoastronomy meeting down there, I saw him again at, in Albuquerque at another meeting, and, and uh, when he heard my talk on the medicine wheel, it was a different talk because I didn't know all this then, but he came up and he said, oh, there's circles all over the Nazca Plains, but they're not as fantastic as all these fun pictures, right? And so they get in National Geographic, and he goes, I ask everybody about those circles, and no one seems to know, or they, they just, I'm not getting anything. So he told me I should go down there <laughs> and check them out. And uh, so I try to get around the world, but so far I've only got to uh, uh, Scotland, and, uh, well, and, and Stonehenge on a different time. But it's so funny, I'll try to get to Canada, and then I'll end up in, in Europe instead. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm trying to get to Canada. <laughs> I'm only just over the border from where I live. Um, but these wheels, regardless of whether they're great big tall stones or on the ground, they can do really similar things. So um, right after I make a star map for the wheel, which I hope I'll get out by this summer, where you can actually take it and open it up while you're there, and check out, you know, moon, sun, stars, according to what the wheel is. And I'm trying to think of a teaching device since I've got a teacher in my background. Um, but once I get the star map done, then I really want to do a book on the similarities in these wheels. It's scary to talk about the similarity if you have people in one place that want to just own it so bad. But how do we own the sky? And one of the just most amazing ways to, ha to mirror and show a map of the sky is a circle. Our horizon's a circle. Everything moves up there in a circle. The stars move in a circle. So this is all over the Earth. The oldest one we've found so far is in uh, Africa, Nabta Playa. And they seem to do very similar things, but I'm starting to be able to detect how one would be used versus another. And in the Orkneys above Scotland, there's actually this little university that's what I call it. Nobody knew what to call it because it had a bunch of small rooms with benches. It didn't look like a house, right? And I'm going, it's a university. <laughs> and so then later, a few archaeologists went, you know, that could be a university. It might have been where they sent like druids, although I don't know if they called them druids that far back. But it has like four or five wheels, all built slightly different with different numbers of stones and different angles and stuff. And so I could just see being a grad student there. I'm like, OK, I'm going to work on the moon. So I'm going to need a wheel that looks this way and points that way and measures this, you know? So it's huge. It's just gigantic. But really, one of the most beautiful spots for one is the one we have right out here. I guess we're done. Thank you. I'm going to be hanging around a little bit upstairs, both with my books and just talking in general. And I always love to talk and listen. I love to listen. And also, if you want to write your name down on a sheet I'll have there, I'll keep you up to breast with anything I figure out or any new books or newsletters or star maps. 
Thank you for being such an awesome audience.